Have you ever been given a second chance? On this Easter Masters Sunday, I want you to know that my golf pencil has an eraser. For we gather to worship a God of second chances, a God who spends more time offering mulligans than keeping track of our mistakes, a God who is more concerned with where we are going than where we have been. But for some people, Easter can be extremely challenging, according to Stephen LeConte. Take this person who forgot to take their chocolate bunny out of the hot car. Or this poor kid who bit into their chocolate Easter egg only to find an actual hard-boiled egg hidden inside. Or what about this grandpa who was forced into wearing pastels? Lots and lots of pastels, if only he were a Tennessee or Auburn fan. Or this grandmother who thought she found an adorable Easter bunny decoration at the store. How about this person who nailed it trying to make Easter-themed deviled eggs? And finally, your heart has to go out to this mom who hid her children's Easter basket in the oven and then forgot completely about it. My favorite is this mom who, had a, who was a little too tired to actually dye the eggs this year. She just wrote the names of the colors on each of the eggs. Yet there's some things I never get tired of hearing. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. I love to hear Christ is risen indeed echoing across the gathered people of God. I love to hear the beautiful music on Easter Sunday as we sing together, Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. I love to hear how about lunch to echo Winnie the Pooh or when someone says I'm in remission or rings that bell after chemo. I love to hear the crash of ocean waves, the laughter of children, and the good news from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the good news according to the Gospel of John. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, help us to be as faithful as Mary there in the early morning, going to continue the journey. Help us to hear our names this Easter. In your name we pray. Amen. Last year, someone called to say, Phil, I have a Sunday ticket for you to the Masters. I so loved to hear that invitation. I couldn't believe my ears. A Sunday ticket for the first time. I was ecstatic. And then I remembered. I'm a preacher, and I needed to be here on Sunday. 
I thanked him for the gracious offer, but had to decline. Then I heard his wife yell in the background, he has Saturday tickets too. Well, maybe next year. At this time of year, there are few better sounds than the sound of a golf ball dropping into the cup. Or have you ever had a day like this? This guy dropped the ball into the cup only to have it jump back out again. Never seen anything like this. You really shouldn't miss it. Guys, it's so close to that water. Oh my! What was that? I have never seen that, but you know something? It hit the bottom of the cup and came back out. Oh, it did go in. It was dead center putt from about four and a half feet, and it actually hit the back of the cup and popped out. And look at my center. I'd never, that never happened to me. Friends, that is not what we mean when we talk of resurrection. Resurrection is something new, a transformation of what was into something even better. I was in a restaurant in Augusta several years ago when I overheard two guys at the bar talking. One said, can you believe that Master Sunday and Easter Sunday are the same day this year? You would think they would know not to schedule Easter during the Masters. It's been 11 years since the Masters was played on Easter Sunday, the 18th time in 87 chances. It won't happen again for another 12 years, thankfully. Yet today, we do celebrate a tradition unlike any other, a crucified Messiah and a resurrected Lord. God has created so many great things to hear in this world, but I read recently that the top three things people love to hear are these. Thank you, I'm sorry, and their own name. Thank you, sorry, and hearing your own name. Now, I'm good with names, and I wish I could call each person at church on Easter Sunday by name. So say your name aloud this Easter morning, for names are so important. So important that there's apparently a monthly meetup for Ryan's at Ryan McGuire's Bar and Restaurant in Manhattan. No non-Ryan's allowed. Back in 2005, there was a gathering in New York City of 164 Martha Stewarts to set the Guinness World Record for the most people of the same name in one place, and I thought having one Martha Stewart in one place was a lot. Last year in Japan, 178 Hirokazu Tanakos showed up to break the Martha's record, which they tried to do in 2017, but only 87 of them showed up. Earlier this year in Serbia, they invited 256 Malika Jovanovic's to set a new record. Yet today, in churches across the world on this Easter Sunday, that record has been totally shattered as millions of people gathered who share the name of Jesus Christ, those of us who trust in or at least want to trust in the resurrection and new life. A professional golfer named Scott Stallings learned the importance of names in recent days. He'd been impatiently waiting for his invitation to play at Augusta this year. He heard that invitations had been sent out, but his never seemed to show up. He even playfully accused his wife, Jennifer, of hiding it from him like an Easter egg. Turns out Scott Stallings is also the name of a realtor here in Chambly. He and his wife, also named Jennifer, went down to their condo in St. Simons, and there on the front porch was a UPS package. Jennifer opened it and yelled to her husband, Scott, we've got master's tickets. But when they actually opened the inside envelope, there was an official invitation for Scott, the realtor, to play in the master's tournament. Scott Stallings, the realtor, is an avid golfer but plays to a 25 handicap. I'm sure he must have considered just showing up at Augusta with his golf bag and asking them to make good on their invitation. Yet he knew that there'd been a mistake, so they reached out to the golfer Scott Stallings via Instagram. The invitation finally made its way into the right hands and the golfer Scott Stallings had to apologize to his wife. This week, the realtor Scott Stallings is enjoying tickets to the Masters. I think they ought to at least let him play around, don't you think? Names are so important. It seems that on that first Easter morning, only Mary Magdalene had opened her invitation. She was the only one that went to the tomb while it was still dark. I'm sure the birdies were chirping their morning songs, but she couldn't hear them. For all her dreams of how things were going to be have seemingly melted away like an Easter basket in the oven. Mary had started following Jesus after he had erased seven demons from her life. We don't know what was haunting her or keeping her from being healthy, mental health issues, addiction, guilt, or shame. We don't know. But Jesus delivered her from those things, erasing what tormented her. And if you've been watching The Chosen, my friend Lauren says he did it with an embrace. 
Alone in her grief, Mary makes her way back to the tomb where her worst fears are realized. The stone's been rolled away. She thinks the body's been stolen. And assuming the worst, she panics and bolts back to invite the disciples to come and see. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Two of the disciples, Peter and John, start running together, neck and neck, back toward the tomb. But pretty soon it starts to become a competition because we love to win, don't we? We love to keep score. John gets there first, but Peter busts right into the tomb where he finds the clothes covering Jesus' body neatly laid out. Like someone has carefully put them in place, Jesus seems to be the first to have gotten a new Easter outfit. You have to wonder what the resurrected Jesus is wearing. Standing outside the tomb, even though John does not fully understand what he's seeing, he sees and believes that what Jesus told them had come true, being the first to do so. And I imagine John saying, I got here first, but then Peter saying, I went in first, then John saying, but I believe first, keeping score. And although Mary is crying her eyes out, she must have also been shaking her head saying, don't you boys remember what Jesus said about the first being last and the last being first? Then almost kind of -of matter-of-factly, we're told the disciples, Peter and John, go back home, leaving Mary all alone at the tomb once again, crying her eyes out, weeping uncontrollably. Have you ever been there when you just couldn't hold back the tears? She peers back into the tomb, and there she sees two angels. I wonder, were the angels there when Peter looked in, but he just missed them? N.T. Wright suggests that we can only see the angels among us through our tears. And I think that is when we see angels most clearly, when we're weeping, when we can't see straight, when tears of sadness flood our vision and the angels show up to help us in our grief and sadness. I see it here at Dunwoody all the time. When there is loss, angels show up. You show the love of Christ by showing up for each other, just like Mary did in that solitary act of early faithful morning devotion. The angels ask her, woman, why are you weeping? They don't ask her, what's wrong or are you okay? They ask, why are you weeping? And I assume it's because they already know the good news that Jesus is risen. Mary doesn't yet know that and is still crying. And she must be thinking, why am I weeping? Has anyone else been crying in recent days? Haven't you seen the news lately from the subdued Easter celebrations in Ukraine to the smoke in Ciudad Juarez, to the flowers laid outside the Covenant School in Nashville, to the devastation of recent tornadoes. Why am I weeping? I'm standing here at the tomb after the death of someone that I love. She then turns away from the empty tomb. It's too much. There she sees the outline of a person in front of her, backlit by the sunrise. She can't see him clearly. And then he says the same thing to her. Woman, why are you weeping? Shouldn't it be obvious, she must say, I'm standing at the graveside and to make matters worse, the body's not where it's supposed to be. Mary does not recognize Jesus yet. She does not expect Jesus to be standing upright upright, or even clothed for that matter. Remember, he left his clothes behind. For some reason, she thinks he's the gardener. Maybe it's his green jacket. She pleads with this would-be gardener, if you've taken him away, tell me where he is, please. And then Jesus cuts through her grief and tears with a word, a word she never thought she would hear from Jesus again. He calls her by name, Mary. What a gift to hear her name. In that instant of recognition, she knows new life is possible. She knows that voice. That is the voice that called her out of the tomb once before, away from her demons and into new life, erasing her past. Jesus has called her by name yet again, Mary. She was looking right at him, but she didn't recognize him. But hearing her name focused her attention, allowing her to see the resurrected Jesus standing in front of her, the one who knew her by name. Now, how many of you know the name Gary Lester? You may know him by a longer name, Gary Lester Watson Jr., to be exact, from the panhandle of Florida. He played golf here at the University of Georgia. At an early age, his dad started calling him Bubba, because as a chubby baby, he reminded him of the football player, Bubba Smith. To the most casual golf fans, Bubba Watson might be known as the golfer who swings a pink driver that he carries for charity, who also hits pink golf balls that could be mistaken for Easter eggs. Watson is a deeply faithful family man who lost his father to throat cancer back in 2010. 
When he and his wife Angie started dating, she wanted him to know that she thought they would have to adopt if they ever wanted to have children. That did not deter Bubba from the relationship, and after getting married, they tried to welcome a new baby for four years. The road to adopting their first child was full of doubt and disappointment. There were three birth moms that didn't choose us, Angie said. You start asking yourself questions during that time, whether or not it's even the Lord's plan for us to be parents, or if I'm fit to be a mom. And Why do these birth moms not think that I would be the right mom for their children? Angie said, we didn't get a yes until our fourth time. Finally, they adopted a one-month-old baby boy and named him Caleb just two weeks before the 2012 Masters Tournament, the last time it was played on Easter Sunday. This brand new dad, Bubba Watson, went on to win the 2012 Masters. Take a look. Did it hook? shot from 50 yards in the trees on Augusta Nationals 10th hole unable to see where he was going Bubba Watson struck the shot of his life another Watson is wearing a green jacket and this time his name is Bubba tears of joy streaming down his face as first he clung to his caddy and then his mother remarkable especially considering he is essentially a golfing accident a complete natural who's never taken a single lesson a regular on YouTube and Twitter, giving fans an inside look at his life away from the sport. And when finally he tearfully donned his green jacket, his wife, former WNBA player Angie Ball, was watching from home with their two-week-old baby son, Caleb. I never got this far in my dreams. It's a blessing to go home my new son. It's going to be fun. Now, when you win a green jacket at Augusta, the only time it can leave the premises is the year after you've won. You have to return it at the beginning of the next tournament. Bubba, a good Southern boy who took his team and family to Waffle House to celebrate his second Masters win with grilled cheese sandwiches and smothered hash browns, is well known for his antics with trophies and such both on and off the course. So when he brought the jacket back, they ask at the press conference, Bubba, what did you do with your green jacket? Bubba could barely answer the question. The tears just started to flow. Bubba, why are you weeping? They ask again, what did you do with your green jacket? And through overwhelming tears, he tells them. I told him that um, I was going to go home and, and wrap Caleb up in it. I'm glad I asked. Thanks, Bubba. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the, uh, the only thing I did with it. You know, I didn't, um, out of respect, out of um, honor, I'll, I'll finish this one. Okay. Try to. <laughs> Out of respect and honor for Augusta National and one of the greatest uh, clubs we have, one of the greatest tournaments. Out of respect for them, I didn't do any of my funny antics that I normally would do. <laughs> and so the only thing I did is wrap Caleb up in it. Thank you. <sighs> okay. That ends our press conference. <laughs> He wrapped his newly adopted son in his green jacket. The way I see it is he went home and wrapped new life in victory. Mary Magdalene heard her name, then wiped the tears of sorrow from her eyes as tears of joy and relief began to flow. She reaches out to Jesus to hug him, but he tells her, do not cling to me. There's still more to be done. So Mary goes back to hold her own press conference. Fighting back the tears, she tells the disciples, I've seen the risen Lord. Jesus called me by name. New life really is possible. I've seen new life wrapped in victory. The message of Easter is just that. God brings new life even out of the most painful situations, erasing our mistakes and wrapping new life in victory. Easter is an invitation for all of us. Whatever our names might be, Jesus invites us to hear our names called and to open our eyes to new life that is right in front of us.
Friends, I have to admit, all my golf rounds are subpar. Not under par, but subpar. Yet we worship a God of second chances, a God of love, a God of mulligans, a God of resurrection. Jesus carries a golf pencil with an eraser. So today, come by or contact the church to get your golf pencil. And rest assured, all these golf pencils have erasers. I read in the Wall Street Journal that when people lose the joy of golf, they should stop keeping score for a while, stop evaluating themselves by a number, and just look for the beauty and possibility of each and every shot. The same is true of life. I'd like to invite you to spend less time keeping score or to use your erasers more. Spend more time seeing the possibilities in each moment Resurrected life erases the mistakes of the past and calls us to new life wrapped in the victory of Easter. New life is possible. New life really is possible. Now, did I tell you what Caleb means? It means devotion to God. It means faithful after years of heartache and disappointment. After years of heartache and disappointment, Bubba and Angie named their child faithful. Devotion to God. Names really are important. So happy Easter. May we all go home to wrap God's faithful gift of new life in victory. And now may we go forth on this Eraser Sunday, I mean Easter Sunday, ready to share the good news of resurrected living. For love keeps no account of wrongdoing, but rejoices in the right. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Mary knew that more than anyone, and we know that when we hear our names. Amen.